Hello, everybody. Welcome to Bo Neiman's Bogus Hangout. I'm going to have our guests introduce themselves. Zara. <laughs> Hi, my name is Zara Altair, and I write for the web. Steve? Uh, Steve Grinser and Gentleman Farmer this week. <laughs> Terry? Terry Van Horn, that's the old pros, and there's nothing gentle about you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know. Doc. Yeah, Doc. Doc Phil of Intrinsic yeah. Value SEO. And I'm Bill Slosky of SEO by the Sea, and the Go I'm the SEO Director of SEO Research at GoFish Digital. So we were uh, chatting a little bit about some, some news going on in the industry, and one of the things we came across was uh, – a uh, discussion on Twitter that was written up in SEO Roundtable about somebody who uh, noticed she had, has a travel site in Greenland. And she has a page that focuses upon viewing northern lights in Greenland. And she lost traffic to the site. Actually, impressions for the site went up, but click-throughs to the site went down. And she had no idea why. And uh, she got into a discussion with uh, Danny Sullivan about it. And I, I responded to her myself because one of the things I checked was uh, Google Trends because my expectation is that most travel sites in these days of COVID uh, are getting less actual search or interest. And so I checked Google Trends and it did show that there was a very uh, steep drop off for the phrase she was optimizing for was Northern Lights Greenland. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't getting as much traffic. But that's not the only reason why the site was getting more impressions and less clicks. So, Terry, Terry, what was the one that you liked about that? Or found oh, the fact that it was at position zero and it was in a carousel of images on mobile so was, you could tell she yeah. didn't even bother to go and look at the cert because so, all she did was look at data and see increased impressions lower click through and didn't so, bother to go to this well, her page her page was in the serps for that but it was also the image from her page was in the carousel of images and that's where she was probably getting most of the clicks or, or a lot of the impressions from that. Right. And the other uh, issue Danny Sullivan pointed out was, or somebody else pointed out, was that the date on the article was from two years ago. So it's quite likely that uh, people searching today, knowing that uh, there's some issues with travel and COVID, see a site that's two years old, they might be less inclined to click on it. So it's still getting lots of impressions and less clicks. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And her page didn't include anything about COVID as I understand it either. And other pages did. Which is the kind of thing you probably, if you're, if you're, uh, Catering to to people who are potentially traveling. Yeah. It'd be a good thing to include. Yeah. Where you could stay with COVID. If there are quarantines. Yeah. If you could countries. even go to the country if they're letting people in. <laughs> yeah, like for a long time, Hawaii, if you want to travel there, you had to come to Hawaii, stay in your hotel room for two weeks, and then you can leave and see Hawaii. All right. And I think New York, uh, New Jersey, and Connecticut were doing that too. You want yeah. to travel to those places from some somewhere like Florida. You had to arrive in quarantine for two weeks before you could see anything. Yeah, there's part of Canada like that. All the Atlantic provinces, it's called the Atlantic bubble. Yeah. You can't go there without taking the quarantine for two weeks. And there's people that are on one side of the border working on the other, and they stop them from coming too. Welcome. 
Yeah, we've got a lot of that down here. Folks that are living on one side of the border and working on the other. And it's really messed a lot of people up. Yeah. Because right now, if you have a visa, a permanent resident visa as a Mexican citizen, you can go into the state. If you if you just have a, a like a shopping, they, they call it a visa, but it's actually a permit, that just lets you go across into San Diego, but you can't go 100 miles north, then you're no longer allowed into the country at all. And Mexico has been getting a lot of pressure from inside, you know, internally to close the border down and not let American citizens in. But the president is not willing to do that. I know. And I know some shot down. I know some uh, cargo pilots who fly international, and they went from loving their jobs to hating their jobs because now, you know, they get to where they're going, and they have to be whisked away to a, a hotel room that they're not allowed to leave until it's time for them to fly again. Yeah. You know, they go from one box to another, and they they have gone to really hating their jobs. Um, because it's just been miserable for them. That's really sad that they now hate their a job that they used to like. Mm -hmm. So we may see some changes to that sometime soon, but not tomorrow and not next week. Uh, they did have some very positive news about a vaccine that yep. came out that uh, was 90% 90, 90 effective. That's the Pfizer one, right? Right. Yeah, yeah but uh, production and distribution are still going to be many months down the road before most of us will have access to it. Exactly. There's also issues with travel. With it. it needs to be kept extremely cold. Oh, the virus itself. No, I mean, the, 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 the vaccine, vaccine has to be vaccine. almost like frozen. And it's a it's a two dose vaccine, so you get one shot, and then you wait a month and get another shot. It'll be good for the schools. That's where they should start, in my opinion, is in the schools. I remember Steve might remember it. I remember having to go and get vaccinated for smallpox yeah. and whatnot. Oh yeah, smallpox, TB. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And you had nothing to say in it. Parents, you know, yeah. they they couldn't stop it. They were just no. doing it regardless. And polio. He either he either gets it or he doesn't come to school. If he doesn't come to school, you go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was the same with polio vaccines too. Oh, you know, we got ours. It was always the uh, the boosters. We had the sugar yeah, cube. Yeah, that's what ours drop, were called too, booster shots. The drop, a drop on a on a sugar cube. We thought that was great. Anybody give us a sugar yeah, cube? Sugar okay, cube. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no poking. No Just poking. needles. But I noticed that you know. Meanwhile, while we're waiting for a a vaccine that is sufficient and works, um, I noticed that. I don't know if you remember a couple of months ago, I had this little surgery on my nose and I went in and, you know, they did the surgery and I was there for half a day or something. And, and now I have a small procedure on Friday and tomorrow I have to go and get tested before I can have the procedure. In other words, they are now testing before anybody goes in to have any kind of medical procedure. Um, to make sure that the people coming into the hospital are not bringing the virus with them. That seems like a pretty good idea. Actually. Yeah, because, yeah. But, yeah, yeah, because the health workers are, are at such risk for exposure. Mm -hmm. I, I read that there's a new uh, testing, quick test from Abbott, which is like 95% uh, accurate. Really, which is which is much better than the uh, previous quick tests, uh, mm -hmm. and if it's that much accurate and could be done in, uh, if you take 20, 30 minutes, wow, to see whether or not you're you're infected, uh, which not, is which I'm is not, much much faster. Yeah, but, that is a lot, that is a lot faster, and I'm 
I'm not sure if that's the case with what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what the testing is. It's just I have to show up and do it or you no know, going for any procedures. Yeah. The antibody, uh, one of those treatments was okay today, too. But it has to be given by uh, transfusion. Mm. That's pretty they, serious. They've done experiments with uh, llamas and ferrets to develop antibodies from them, which tend to be smaller than human antibodies, and they're referring to them as nanobodies. Interesting. And, and they, they, they create a na nasal spray from those. And it doesn't, act, it doesn't act as a vaccine, but it does give some limited amount of immunity. Hmm. So ferrets are mustelids like minks in Denmark. But I guess it's too late for that. Well, it, it's good seeing these therapeutics coming up, people developing them. It is. It's very good. And I think I was reading yesterday that even though the number of cases are going up, that the percentage of death is lower than it was at the beginning. Because you already killed off a quarter million people. <laughs> That we're close to that. We already, already culled the herd a little bit. Got yeah, right. <laughs> and usually, usually it takes a little while for the uh, deaths to catch up to the cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you, you come down with COVID before you die from it. Sadly, but. Yeah. Well, kind of how it works. And... It's going to be, I think, the, the interesting thing is going to be, A, to find out eventually find out what sort of what the length of immunity really is is it a six month a yeah. 12 month a 10 year whatever and yeah. then of course all of the the complications and ongoing complications after you recover you know what, what are there going to be the long-term effects on your lungs on your kidneys on your liver on your heart that right. may not manifest themselves for three or four years down the road particularly with with uh kids and, you know. and most most people believe mistakenly that COVID only lasts for two weeks. <laughs> there are a lot of, a lot of people who are long haulers, like ten percent of the people get infected, who continue to show symptoms for months after mm -hmm. yeah. they yeah. first get infected. And some of those symptoms are are serious. You know, they have to deal with internal organs and how they function, and you know. Their effects on the immune system that linger. Heart. Mm -hmm. There is a baseball player that had complications with his heart afterwards. One I read here not uh, just a couple of weeks ago that was kind of concerning is that they've got several cases now that are shown up with complications to the the veins and arteries. That it's breaking down the walls of the of the blood vessels and you bleed to death internally that's <laughs> there's, there's no symptoms there okay, okay, I mean, okay. Your, your blood pressure is going to drop off and within a minute you're going to be dead but you're not going to okay. have a headache you're not going to have nausea you're not going to have a temperature you're going to be asymptomatic until you suddenly collapse and by the time your head hits the floor you're dead you know on, on that note i i uh quote we uh Get back to SEO. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so so Google Search Console, you used to be able to submit URLs, uh, and you haven't been recently. Uh, and John Mueller was asked about that uh, recently. He said, "Well, let's have let's start hearing from people why they need it back," which I'm is kind of which is kind of frightening. Well, uh, yeah, so it, it's obviously that, obviously Google hasn't really done a use case analysis or a user analysis of that particular feature. Um, yes, there are an awful lot of people who use it for spamming and um, getting their links to their website index. That's where I would, I would wager most of the use of that comes from. But there are, 
legitimate uses on the other side of that as well. Yeah, Terry, you, sure. you, you had a good uh, reason. Yeah, if you have a sale that's only one day, yeah, that's you can't put it up before and you can't, you know, and <laughs> they're not going to find it in one day. So you have to use that too. Now, that's I, a good reason. There's I lots know, of stuff like that. I know there are e-commerce sites that do things like sell pajama bottoms for one week and then switch the sale to sell pajama bottom tops the next week. Yep. Yeah. And and if you don't act quickly, you end up with half sets of pajamas. Yeah, you also can't put that stuff up early either. So Google can just cover it on time for the sale. So the sale's got to last a week. If you look at indexing, it took could what they set up to two weeks for indexing, correct? Mm -hmm. So, you know, <laughs> sale could be over for two weeks when they finally get around to indexing it. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things I pointed out is, you know, what happens when your uh, SEO plugin goes rogue and you need to fix that and get your site re-indexed? Um, yeah. Right. You know, how many weeks could you go without being in the index simply because of a mistake that was beyond your control because of a plugin? Yeah. And there are legitimate and, use for sure. And um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna put the link to the search engine roundtable article that's from, and I believe there's a link to uh, the survey that yeah uh, there is. John is performing, and there's in case any viewers want to uh, speak up and and say why you want the URL submission back in the Google Search Console. I like having it, but then again, I, I'm, I'm I'm concerned about all the scrapers out there that like to copy my content and post it on the web and share it on uh, Twitter and Facebook and other places as if it was theirs. Yeah. Also, if Google screwed up the can canonicalization, uh, URL on your page. That's how the best, the fastest way to fix it is to re-index the page to get the right canonical. Because if it's, you if wait for them to re-index to recrawl the page, well, they would be ignoring it because the canonicalization is not correct. So this is something you've done. Oh no no! I just say it. I just <laughs> it just came to me. Well, well, what about the people who had uh, their canonical changed without their knowing it on Google? That's the fastest way to repair that is to re-index the page or recrawl the page and get it re-indexed. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's something going on with indexing. I you know I don't want to be the guy who you know, crying wolf, but uh, something ain't right. And the way John is answering the questions doesn't seem natural. Doesn't seem like him, how he would normally do things. Okay, so if you get a page with two canonicals and they're different, Google throws his hands up in the air and says, I don't know, and walks away? <laughs> yes, they should. That's, that's what it looked like in, in that article, yeah. So, <laughs> well, that's what John said they do. They just. I mean, I've, I've seen instances where pages have two sets of titles and two sets of meta descriptions, mm -hmm. and they seem to don't mind indexing one of those. Yeah, I would be yeah. more inclined to believe that Google would either take the first one or take the one they like the best, but just walking away just doesn't sound like a Google decision. Well, as John said, it's not a directive. They kind of try and figure it out another way if, if they can't do it by the canonical on the page. Match up the non-boilerplate content? and see which is a better match? Well, he said they basically try and figure out the canonicalization another way. What other way? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's Google. Who knows what goes on inside the black box? 
I think I think there was a discussion with uh, John and Martin, where Martin was explaining how they might uh, strip out the boilerplate, make a hash of the remaining content, and compare them. Mm. Okay. Mm. That would seem to be a pretty quick and uh, low resource solution. Well, that would just come. ignore the canonical, which is probably the first thing they do. So if they're an, ignoring the canonicals, do you have to alert them that that's happening, or do they care? Or? Well, you know, your page doesn't even really need a canonical yeah. unless uh, you have two pages that are the none same. Of, none of them had one for many years. Yep, <laughs> but we got but along then, just fine without them. In the instance that Google thinks your canonical should be a different page than the one you've selected, they won't index your page. Right. So having the canonical sometimes can mean that your page doesn't get indexed if you're the wrong one. Yeah, if the canonical is wrong, you definitely, they just ignore the page. Pretty sure. Why would why would you have the wrong canonical? Why okay, it, it's word shit happens. <laughs> for example, I switched my site to HTTPS from HTTP, ah, okay. yeah, and okay. and I I didn't uh, do a new Google Search Console for the HTTPS version. Right away, I, I waited two weeks. I should have done it right away. <laughs> But because I waited, uh, Google went through, said, okay, these pages are all HTTPS and the canonicals are HTTP. So he's chosen the wrong canonicals. Yeah. And they removed the number of pages from the index. Mm. Which they put back as soon as you put as the right as, canonical in. As soon as I the HTTPS version in Google Search Console, yeah. And and submitted the uh, uh, XML site map for that. Which oh, is a good so reason have, two signals. Which is a good reason to have an XML site map. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which, which leads to another uh, <coughs> article we were looking at. So should all sites have XML sitemaps, even small ones? I never had one on any of my sites for years. Yeah. I've always been a believer that the XML sitemaps were just a, a cover for poor navigation. Yep. Yep. Agreed. Same with the HTML sitemap, same deal. Yeah. There's a crash there's for a bad navigation. There's a Google white paper called Beyond the Crawl of Duty, which is about XML sitemaps and describes how New York Times, Amazon, and PubMed all use XML sitemaps to try to make sure that fresh index, fresh content was getting indexed quickly. And they can show it was helping uh, Google discover new pages when they use XML sitemaps. And they they organize them in ways where uh, new content was discovered more but quickly by Google. That was more of a side of. I mean, I I think that's more of a side effect of Google taking the opportunity to uh, burn less of their own bandwidth and crawl budget by instead of crawling a website, they just hit the sitemap, and if nothing's updated on the sitemap, they move on, and that has become. You know, and so if you don't have a sitemap, you're forcing Google to re, you know, actually crawl your site. And if you do have a sitemap, you know, and you have something configured wrong, like it's not updating the sitemap every time you update a page or something, then Google's just going to skip it and not see the changes. Correct. Okay, so what it what it means in effect is that whatever is easiest way for Google to discover new pages on your site is one they'll use because they're yeah. going to download those machine readable 
XML sitemaps quickly and yeah. check them quickly against the list of known site, known pages to see what else they might have to crawl. And if there's something new in there, they'll crawl those. Right. The problem is, I guess I don't, I, sh I shouldn't say it's the problem is. The issue becomes up when you have mom and pop operations, small websites, uh, people who aren't fluent in machine language, uh, for whatever reason, misconfiguring their sitemap, not updating their sitemap. Uh, and there's a whole list of ways this could simply go wrong in very few ways that it goes right. And, you know, we're back to relying on people who, you know, the, the local hair salon who somebody put together a website for them on the cheap five years ago. They're just flat screwed because, you know, they don't have the budget, the time, or the money to to handle any of this. While Google on the other side goes, don't care, spend the money. Okay. In addition to what I just said, I did have, I did routinely uh, submit sitemaps when you used to be able to do it. I don't think you can anymore. Yeah, through Google Search Console, submit the sitemap every month. You uh, can submit. You can submit sitemaps through Google Search Console. Oh, you still can do that. Yeah, okay. you still can. Yeah, and yeah. Can, yeah. Because uh, I like it because I could go back later and see the actual day that they crawled the site when they actually updated the site map I had. And I did notice when I started doing that, regular updates through that, I yeah. seem to get uh, better crawling from them. So Because people do submit site maps with uh, 301s and 302s and 404s for pages in site maps. That's another reason that I started doing a monthly check was I yeah. first do the site map, then I pull it into Excel and go through the Excel file, see portals, because WordPress does make some poor URLs sometimes or someone puts an extra slash. All kinds of mistakes happen. That comes up staring you in the face. And it doesn't take but a few minutes to review a site with a couple of thousand URLs on it. So it was worth the time then. And it did seem to help in the number of pages that got crawled and indexed. It could be because I showed I was doing regular maintenance too. It might not have just been that. It might have been the fact every month I went to GSC and cleaned everything up in there. It's not necessarily a myth that Google prefers well-maintained and managed sites. Mm -hmm. When you have lots of, lots, easier. when you have lots of broken links and redirects that don't go anywhere and stuff like that. Uh, That's a know, bad user experience. Yeah. It, Happen a lot on EDU sites uh, where, where they have like open discussion forums where classes could get together and talk about uh, the week's reading or stuff like that. And people would scam the heck out of those things because they were completely uncontrolled. You didn't need a password to get into them and you could post. And that's how you had so many uh, spam uh, college websites with with uh, uh, pharmaceutical spam. I may have had a few of those blog sites in the past. If I hear you say you may or may not have had, <laughs> I, I don't think there's any may not have involved there. Uh, <laughs> What I was wondering if Google put sitemaps on those little sites that they're giving people now, three or four page site. I saw one of them ranking in the local path for SEO. Nice. <laughs>
Uh, and Google Docs can also get crawled and ranked too. Oh, yeah. Yep. Keep them folders private. Hmm. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how much authority you get from Google for that. Uh, probably depends on how many links you have to you. Oh, from Google, right? Yeah. I wonder if they have a directory of those small sites that people built. <laughs> oh, now I'm going down a bad path, I think. Yeah. Steve, care to join me? The, there are no bad paths. <laughs> there are simply bad endings. Some are just a little more. I, I'd refer to those as rabbit holes. <laughs> yes. Just wear your muck boots, you'll be fine. <laughs> uh -huh. So, uh, and you have uh, exact match domains. Not anymore. I mean, we've got a couple that are kind of, I mean, they still have the brand name in them. But the brand name plus a primary keyword, stuff like that. Yeah. Search and Engine Journal thinks, uh, seem to think I do SEO pros is on every article I think on that website. <laughs> <laughs> so is there still value in exact match domains? Oh. And it has nothing to do with uh, them being exact match domains. They don't boost that. It's a natural relevancy, again, from having keywords in your URLs. Yeah. That's common sense, SEO 101. Right. But, but when uh, I first saw articles from Google or patent, at least one patent from Google that talked about exact match domains, they said, they're gaining more relevance than other sites. Like Amazon doesn't sell Amazons. Yahoo doesn't sell Yahoos. Right. Uh, right. So, so they shouldn't rank for those things. So you, your brand may not necessarily be a good match for the products that you sell and the services you provide. Mm -hmm. Should it make that much difference to how you rank for those keywords for those products or services we, we we see this problem in a lot of um the maker community where you know their domains tend to be their name plus what they do yeah uh and the people who seem to have the most problem with it are the people who do multiple things so then they go they switch from you know terry van horn you know automotive repair you know hot rodding and now he's doing painting and he's also doing sculpture and none of the other things ever rank ever right because they can't sorry, you hear, sorry you hear that terry yeah huh? sorry you hear that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> over my head. We're sorry to hear your website's not doing well oh. <laughs> because of it. And and so you know when I talk to people who are just getting into the space or just thinking about building their first website, we have a discussion about do you intend to get into other things? Like the name for my company is very generic because I knew I was going to be doing all the things. And if I had woodworking in the name of my, my new company, then I would struggle with rod building and all the other issues. Yeah. Because I've skewed the homepage and the primary URL so far the other direction that it, you know, now I've got to climb uphill for the other things. So I, I still, I mean, the exact match domain still plays a role. Problem is, is, it can play a role negatively as well. And it's simply because of the words in the URL, like it's always been, 
you know, back when people stopped doing anchor text because they were getting hammered for too much exact Mac anchor text, but they were still using their complete URL because it still had the keywords in it. You know, you could kind of sidestep that problem. There's also a problem with uh, domains that, that uh, could be segregated differently. And they'd spell other things like yep. experts exchange uh, would sometimes uh, therapist.com uh, <laughs> experts exchange would be something like expert sex change, right? So sometimes the exact match domains weren't necessarily the matches you expected. Yeah. I don't believe there was ever a boost just for having the exact match domain. I never believe it, that. It's the same thing as the myth about the boost for being an EDU site. Right. Well, it's, it's, there it's, is it's not no. because of the domain. It's because of all the, the safety and linking to it generally. Yeah, people from Google did admit that sometimes the exact match domains were getting more relevance than they probably should have. Yeah, that was back in match day. In other words, the they day. were weighting URLs too heavy in the ranking. Yeah, probably. Yeah. However, they did at one point go after EMDs that were spamming. I remember that for like a long ways back. They were targeting dot info that were uh, exact match too. I, I think there was a propensity for people who are using exact match domains to also engage in some keyword spamming. Yeah. Because, because they figured they could get away with it with the domain name. So when I tried elsewhere. There was a, a TLD that they com almost basically completely banned the entire TLD. It was like, what was it, like .cc .info or something like that? I think it was because, info. Because it, it was, was info. Well, no, there was another. No, you could still oh. rank it on the site. But this was like a, a country-level TLD that was giving away free domains, and all the spammers ran there. And you, it was impossible to find a legitimate site with that TLD. So basically, the whole thing got bounced. Mm. That sounds about right. That was, but that was, <laughs> that was a long created time. Created a huge honey pot. <laughs> yeah. So my my favorite uh, story that spam was from a Microsoft paper called "Spam, Damn Spam, and Statistics," and they said, yeah. okay, in, Ger in Germany, spammers were buying domain names. And so they didn't have to pay for more than one domain name. They were creating subdomains. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were adding uh, syllables. They were, they were uh, hyphenating subdomains. And there was a direct correlation between the number of hyphens in the subdomain and the amount of spam on those pages. I yeah. think there was at one point even uh, too many hyphens was uh, targeted by Google. I know I had some that were pretty long that I just gave up the <laughs> domain after I I saw, oh, these don't rank anymore. I'm not going to bother <laughs> renewing the domain. This stuff, it doesn't work. Now, I'm not sure. I've, I've, seen, I've seen a hyphenated domain in a while. Mm. It's I not my, as my common as it used to be. I let my only one expire here about two years ago. Silver Bullet SEO was hyphenated. And besides it being just a gag site anyway, I mean, it was it was uh, obvious that it wasn't ever going to go anywhere. Yeah. You remember, remember when, and again, back in Match Day, remember when there was the big discussion about which is better in your domain name, a or actually in the URL, a dash, you know, hyphen, or an underscore? Or underscore, yeah. yeah. Everybody, everybody had been using underscores, and yep. <laughs> they clarified that's not a good thing. <laughs> and and you're fine with capitalizing letters and domain names. Yeah. The the problem with that was though, from a programming perspective, underscore meant space. Yeah. 
And then Google comes along and changed that entire dynamic and said, oh, no, this is the way we want it done now. And it's like, you don't understand. We've been programming this way for 30 years <laughs> in real programming languages. And yeah. now you want us to say, change something simply because it makes it better for you? It is and, just that. Uh, Steve, an underscore, if you put a, uh, a URL and you link it and you there's a line under it, people didn't see the underline no, they didn't in see it. the <laughs> URL. Yeah, so webmasters yeah. quit using them for that reason. Yeah, well, I, I, I know that was the primary reason why people got away from them. But still, I mean, it was just just more of the, I yeah. <laughs> now, pretty well, there everybody uses hyphen, the underscore. That's how you can tell a guy's been programming a really long time if he's using <laughs> underscores. He's probably been doing it longer than 25 years. So somebody doing COBOL or Fortran. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or basic. <laughs> There's a bunch of them. Uh, so I was doing basic in 76 on my let's see I wrote my first video game in 79 or 80 and wrote my first networked video game over Apple link on the Apple IIe in like 82 or 83. Um, so, yeah, I'm old. <laughs> that reminds me, I've got to binge watch uh, Halt and Catch Fire. How have you seen that show? That you know, good. Oh, I, that's an excellent one. Is it? I enjoyed the first couple of seasons, but the longer it went, the worse it got. The fourth, the fourth season, they went to search and search engines. Yeah. Hmm. It's a uh, halt and catch fire. Yeah, it's really good. I watched it when it first came yeah. out, and I've watched it a second time since. Since I've been <laughs> retired, I watched a few things over. Hell on Wheels, I watched that on twice too. It's always fun to to watch that show and then try to figure out which companies they're they're trying to mimic. It's like, oh, I know which company that one was. <laughs> well, the one was definitely copying Yahoo. Yeah. Mm. Right Basically, down to the first, uh, editor's first added. known programming language. I programmed in BASIC in 82, 83. And then, and then, and so I could help people. I was always helping people with stuff, you know, and then, um, and then Microsoft happened, and and it was way beyond my coding skills, and that was kind of the end of my coding. Because <laughs> it just exponentially went beyond. Yeah. I, re I remember one Christmas, my dad asked us if we wanted an Atari 2600 or a Tandy color computer. I was like, ah. Give me the cocoa, man. I want the computer. <laughs> I, can go to, I can go to my friend's house and play Atari. <laughs> I've still got that out in the shop. I need to get my wall of obsolete technology finished. <laughs> I have... It, I have some space in that cabinet there, Steve, because there's going to be some new chunks going in over the next few years. <laughs> no, no, no. My, my stuff stops at the 8088 processor. I've even got an old uh, Mattel Aquarius computer Ooh. with the little tiny wow. chicken keys. And oh my God, I've only seen like four of those. But oh yeah, I love that stuff. It's awesome. The, the, the things we could do with 4K of RAM. <laughs> yep but I remember my my son this must have been 1978 because he was just a little pipsqueak he was five but he traded chess chess lessons for coding lessons with his best buddy because 
we didn't have a computer then, but his friend did, and so he would go over to his friend's house and play around with the computer, and that was a long time ago. I would love to get my old Altair back, but that was gone a long time ago, and now to replace it, you're looking at multiple thousands of dollars for a box <laughs> of lights. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I remember we had a yard sale one day, and the damn thing was so big and old and bulky, I gave my Osborne to some guy for five bucks. And it ran. It was a worker. <laughs> I almost got a Cray 2 computer, mm. supercomputer from the United States Air Force. <laughs> I had an IBM System 36 I brought home in the back of my truck. Yeah. <laughs> Put it in the garage, and the truck would no longer fit when I, once I got it in there, of course. Word, word got out that they were dumping theirs. Yeah. They, were, they were done with it at, at, at Kirtland, and they just wanted somebody to haul it off for scrap because it was so big. And, you know, I heard about it. By the time I got there, it was already being loaded on somebody else's flatbed. It's like, holy shit, that's a lot of... I would have filled my whole garage. It drained more power than the whole neighborhood was using. <laughs> <laughs> I still would have loved to have had it. <laughs> That would have been an awesome thing to have. Mm -hmm. I, I have a buddy of mine that still has an old Amdahl uh, 15 hertz uh, main processor at home. He's got uh, he out in his shop. And you can actually fire the thing up. Uh, he doesn't do any processing with it, but you can actually fire it up and, and uh, run the decks and all that. He's got a, a PDU out in front of it. And he's got a couple tape decks off on one side. You know, it looks like a movie set. But it, it just collects dust. <laughs> I need to find me some old televisions with the old RCA inputs and stuff so I can get some of my old computers working again. <laughs> or figure out a way to make them push data to an L LCD. I've got a couple, I think. For me, it was software. So in the early 80s, there were, gosh, I've forgotten the name of it. It was a spreadsheet program. Lotus uh, one two three. No, it was before Lotus. Oh yeah, I know which one you're talking about. Yeah. Anyway, it was just like miraculous because you put in the formulas and it did everything. I mean, it was just it was like a miracle, and I, mean, I was my mind was blown. <laughs> and then then there was there was that one, and then there was another one, and then there was Lotus. Look at that. I've got, let me see, almost the entire run oh, wow. of all of these. This one's from May 83 with Space Trek. <laughs> I love this stuff. I, That's going back. I feel bad for a lot of the kids today. They just don't understand how much fun the 70s and 80s were when it came to computers. Now it's like buy one, plug it in, and load your game. Yeah. I think some of it is, well, kids are learning Minecraft, little kids. And because um, my granddaughter is nine and she's been fiddling around with Minecraft for at least four years. Mm -hmm. I, I play Minecraft with my five-year-old granddaughter. We have a ball. Yeah, it's it's one of the it's one of the things they do father-daughter time is Minecraft. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I logged into Warcraft uh, a couple months ago and spent a day playing that. Went up a bunch of levels and haven't touched it since. <laughs> and my daughter is big time into she she gets on all day every day call of duty playing she'll be have her phone sitting off on one side and she's sitting there talking to somebody you know they're they're double teaming somebody and <laughs> my wife gets very upset about it <laughs> Por qué? why why does she get upset about it Oh, just because she spends all as far as, you know, she's, she's oh, spending I all day killing, life, killing, yeah. killing, 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 <laughs> killing. Well, 
I just tell her, I said, well, probably some of those bastards needed killing, you know? <laughs> you sure did. So why'd you kill him? He needed it. There you go. Oh, my God. I do remember just, typing in a graduate school paper using my girlfriend's computer with word processing. What was the big one in the mid 80s? Word processing. Word? Word star? Word, word star. Word star. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I typed the too. whole thing, including footnotes. And it only <laughs> took and it only took me two hours and the whole thing was formatted and the footnotes were at the bottom and the you know and, and it, it it was mind blowing because the first time I went to graduate school there were no computers, there was typing and carbon paper and I can remember two AM sessions where the next line of the footnote didn't fit on the page, so I had to Take it all out. Start the whole page all over again. Retype the whole page. Yeah. So. So one one of the colleges I applied to required that you bring in a laptop. Really. But the others didn't. I, I think nowadays it's sort of expected you have a laptop. I think you're expected to have a laptop. Yeah, that's part of the deal. I used to have one of those old. I still have somewhere one of the Tandy one hundred. Um, quote laptop it has a, a six line led screen and oh, right. it's powered by like six double a batteries and i took that on a plane on the plane with me one day just as a joke and the guy next to me is pulling out his laptop and i pulled this thing out I'm <laughs> <trying to work. laughs> little <laughs> At first, he wasn't sure what the hell was going on. He's like, "Is that wait? That's that's really small." I'm like, "Yeah, he uses AA batteries and everything. It's awesome." <laughs> yeah, once you get used to the smell of the burning coal, it's okay. <laughs> Oh, man. I don't know. It was fun then. You used to be play a lot. Yeah. Do experiments. So, it's so, nice. I still get to... Go ahead. So have, have any of you had a bunch of pages from your sites disappear overnight? No. But I have a tiny site. Because John Mueller had somebody ask him about their website, oh, yeah, which 18, lost 18,000 pages. pages overnight. Wow. That would suck. Yeah, John said not to worry about it. happens all the time. Yeah, read sure. that. That was kind of a wimpy, wimpy. That's going to make him feel better, eh? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know many SEOs who would uh, drop 18,000 URLs 18, pages. and not, not wonder what happened. It's it's like when uh, your e-commerce website stops getting orders for a day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and they don't say anything. And the next day they get no orders. And then you they contact you and you say, okay, did you check to make sure your contact form is still working or your uh, ordering forms? They said, no, can we do that? I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you just ignore the order when it comes in. <laughs> mm. Sometimes, got, sometimes websites do break. The, the worst one of those I ever got, I got a phone call on like a Tuesday. And they're like, what's going on with the website? I'm like, I don't know. What do you mean what's going on with the website? I said, well, it's been down since Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> you know? You're just noticing now? Per, well, perhaps it may have been appropriate. 
Go ahead. Well, we just figured you were working on something. It's like, have I ever taken your website down? First of all, period, ever. And two, have I ever not called you and told you I was going to be working on something critical and things might get a little weird? No. Sickle, so why would you think that five days of no website at all? <laughs> well, we found out the new secretary had come in and apparently she knew something about WordPress and changed the, uh, uh, what do you want to call it, the um, URL structure. Uh, change the permalinks. Yeah, she changed the permalinks. Unfortunately, I had set it so that couldn't happen. It was so it would not update the HT access file without you know me doing it. And yeah. she did that. It broke and nothing worked. And yeah, this was a long time ago, but still, it was a pain in the ass. But why would you be doing that, Steve? Because some people think they know websites. Oh, I see. Okay. I, I yeah. choose. We had one one lady used to work for one of my current clients. I would go in to do my weekly touch on their website to update plugins and run backups and stuff. And like three weeks in a row, there were no plugins that needed updated. And I'm like, then I emailed her. So what's going on? She goes, oh, whenever I see those need updated, I just click the button. It's like, mm, no, 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 no. I know what I'm doing. It's like, no. <laughs> I don't care if you know what you're doing or not. This is my responsibility. Stay out of it. And she got all mad. You're using the automatic updates in WordPress now for no, no, never. you're not? Nope. I've I, got I'm doing it. I haven't the, had any problems at all. Most of the sites I run have custom code in them somewhere. Oh, okay. And I absolutely refuse to run automatic updates because it seems like every time I allow it. Now I take that. There are a few plugins that I allow to auto update. Um, I allow WordPress to auto update and a few things like that. But anything that's actually critical to the functioning of the website, no. I, I like making backups of the site before I update those. Yeah, yeah I was, every well, time. I generally do yeah. too. If Plugin, I'm doing theme, that. or core. I always do a backup first. So maybe I'll you, shut you learn, off. You learn, you learn that the hard way. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's how I learned it. You only got to do it once. Yep. Yeah, I just did it because it said you should back these things up before <laughs> you update. So I tend to follow the directions of, of the manufacturer. It seems to help. You, to do you back up, you update, and you back up again. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I, I just assumed that they were testing those before they let, uh, did the update to you make know, sure that it's compatible with your uh, with your theme. You you have so many other software on your site, your WordPress site that have been developed by other people. That the possibility of conflicts That's exists. Nine times out of ten, yeah. It's usually the plugin itself may work just fine until you're also running this other plugin and right. they're for some address and it's showing it's us. off the wall function someplace. Yeah. In the early days, yeah. WordPress before yeah. automatic, you know, WordPress used to ensure that a plugin that was on their repository had verified to the current version. Right, or they now, tell you this hasn't been tested for your but, version. Yeah, and, and now they just simply rely on the plugin provider to say if they have tested it to the current version. Mm -hmm. uh, if they catch you lying, you're out of there. I'm coming to your house. I'm going to turn that stuff off. Then. Yeah, but, the, but I have experienced where, you know, an update to a plugin then causes a conflict with another plugin and things go. Oh, yeah. Screwy, just screwy. Well, I mean, realistically, it's impossible for all the plugin developers to test against every combination. Okay. Right, right, exactly. You, you have to manage that on your own. Um, the problem is, is nowadays, if you don't update quickly, you're going to end up with a hacked website. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's basically why I decided to let them auto update. But the next version of WordPress is going to update to the newest version of jQuery. So hopefully most plugin manufacturers are up have updated their plugins so they'd run it with that version of jQuery if they need it. Taking any bets, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> it it didn't work two versions of WordPress ago when they yep. updated the first time. So I'm not sure. I really doubt it. <laughs> I think there's so many themes and stuff that are so far out of date. They're not, you know, you go to WordPress and look at it, uh, say for instance, a plugin and, oh, they haven't done anything on this in two years. You know, right. no, uh, they haven't answered any questions about it or done anything or updated it in two years. Yeah. Yeah, well, they should just kick them out of the repository. <laughs> it's certainly a good time to take it off your site. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, <laughs> or something that doesn't work, well, I guess, with the current version, but, yeah. you know, it might work with an older version. And I know people that don't update because they can't, because to update it would break oh. the their their programming or whatever wouldn't work. A lot of times I will find, you know, a plugin. I might have, you know, half a dozen plugins that I really like for their function that I'll put them on a client's new site. And I'll go and I'll find out that it's, you know, since the last time I installed it, we're going through three versions of WordPress. This is not tested to the current version. I bet 80% yeah. of the times that happens to me, I'll go ahead and install it and test it and it works just fine. Yeah, with the newest version, you know, so they just haven't tested it. It doesn't mean that it failed the test. It just means they haven't tested it. Right. And almost always they'll test out. OK, and what I'll usually do then is I'll go ahead and send a, a note to the developer and tell them, FYI, I just installed this version of your plugin on this version of WordPress, shaked it down. It looks like everything is fine. Just gives them one more indication, you know. But uh, yeah, you know, and there's there's one that not too long ago, I, the last website I built, in fact, I think I uh, went to install it and I thought, Jesus Christ, it's been three and a half years since they updated this thing. Mm. Now, yeah, it might mean that they've got that thing down pat. It's got no bugs <laughs> in it. It might mean that, but <laughs> I'm not going to risk a client sight on that, you know. Right. So many other things have changed in the meantime since yeah. they came out with it that... <laughs> There's chances are very good they haven't tested it with those things. If they're not responding to uh, uh, questions in a support forum. Yep. That's that's time to boot them to the curb there. Yeah. Or not install it. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean. That's just... usually I skip it and go on to the, another one. Well, yeah, and just about any plugin you might be looking for, there's always you can almost one. surely find three or four or a dozen competitive plugins out there. You know, yeah. they may not have as many installs. They may not have as many years doing it. You know, it's a crapshoot, but it's not the only game in town that performs that one function. Not anymore. Unless it's AMP. It used to be. You know, <laughs> I remember when the, the WordPress repository for plugins would be 12 or 20 pages. Now it's more like 1300 pages. <laughs> mm -hmm. we're, we're at the top of the hour, everyone. So thank you all. And have a good week. Thanks for joining Bye. us, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Take care.